We're going to get back to uh, one of our top stories, that the news that South African President Cyril Raposa under increasing pressure after uh, leading the ruling ANC party to their worst election results for years. Lee McGuinn has been uh, looking through the press reaction for us. He's going to start with the uh, local press on you, Liam. Yeah, and considering uh, the ANC are polling at 40% and they've never polled lower than 50% since 1994, it really is a bit of a disaster for them. And I'll start with the business day. They have the headline, Welcome to a New Coalition Country. They pose the question, what next? How will a government be formed saying that the next few days or weeks will be all about compromise. The centre-right DA remains the second largest party in Parliament with 87 seats and said they're open to talks, open to a coalition. However, the party opposes two of ANC's key priorities, uh, that is its black empowerment policies and a promise for universal health care for all. The ANC has said that both policies are non-negotiable. On the other hand, the MK party led by Ramaphosa's predecessor, Jacob Zuma, came third. They said they would work with the ANC, but not while it's led by Ramaphosa. I'll move across to yesterday's Sunday Times. This is the country's most read newspaper. They have a photo of an ANC chairperson looking rather forlorn on the front page. They also have the news that Jacob Zuma wants an election rerun. He says that the vote was rigged amongst other voting irregularities. I'll finish with this uh, opinion piece also in the Sunday Times, uh, opining that Ramaphosa has the worst record of any ANC president pointing out that the economy has collapsed and unemployment soared under the president, also making the argument that in many other countries, a leader who'd led his party to such a disastrous result would be forced to resign. The article finishes by posing the question, if the economy and the ANC are worse off than they were six years ago, then why should Ramaphosa stay? Let's take you to uh, Russia for this next story now. A foreign ministry foundation is now suspected of funding the legal defence of spies abroad. Tell us what this is about, Leo. Yeah, so what's officially known as Pravfond, or uh, the longer term, Fund for Support and Protection of the Rights of Compatriots Living Abroad. Not so catchy, I see why they call it Pravfond. <laughs> it's intended to support Russian nationals and NGOs amongst what they call continuing growth of Russophobic sentiment. But according to this, in Le Monde this morning, leaked internal documents show that it's in fact a Kremlin influence operation active in 48 countries across the world. This piece reveals that the bulk of the budget has so far been used to finance the defence of personalities suspected of being Russian spies and also personalities deemed important to the Kremlin. One such example is in 20, uh, 2014, Pravfund paid €240,000 in legal fees for the defence of Viktor Boots, a Russian arms dealer sentenced in 2012 to 25 years in prison in the United States before finally being released in 2022 in a prisoner exchange with American basketball player Brittany Griner. Uh, Viktor Boot has actually since returned to politics. He was elected to Parliament last year on a ticket supporting Vladimir Putin. The Pravfund Foundation is also suspecting of funding disinformation pro pro uh, projects. This is, again, according to Le Monde last year, the foundation provided €20,000 for a news website called Euromore. It was supposed to take over from state media RT and Sputnik, which had been banned in Europe since the invasion of Ukraine. Its main themes, the special operation in Ukraine, Russophobia in Europe and the protection of the Russian language. It also promotes the speeches of Western political figures supposed to have a constructive attitude towards Russia and especially Vladimir Putin and the Kremlin, such as Hungarian Prime Minister Viktor Orban or the Serbian President Alexander Vucic. Now from uh, Russia to the Pacific for this next story. The tiny uh, nation of Palo is blaming China for hacking, something uh, which could have wide-ranging repercussions. Yeah, it's a really interesting long read in the New York Times, actually. It's about Palau, which is a clump of about 350 small islands in the Pacific, which has become increasingly important to the United States. And earlier this year, Washington finalised a long-delayed plan to give the country hundreds of millions of dollars in aid over two decades. But hours before diplomats gathered at the US Embassy to celebrate that news, the island nation was hit by an enormous cyber attack. More than 20,000 documents were stolen from the government and then leaked online. 
Palau is one of the only the few countries in the world that officially recognizes Taiwan as an independent democracy. The leaders of Palau say the hack was orchestrated by China, who wanted to send a message. China rejects that accusation uh, with a ransomware group known as Dragon Force claiming responsibility. But Palau says that organization was hired by Beijing. And the breach really presents a danger to the United States. Hackers could use the information gleaned from it to tailor more sophisticated phishing attacks. And the leak documents could also prove troublesome to other countries. They include diplomatic communications with countries such as Japan, Israel and the US going back to the mid 2000s, as well as identification details of the high ranking Japanese military officials. Now we're going to finish in New York. Uh, a couple of caught more than they were bargaining for. Well, fishing at the weekend. It's not just a big fish, this is it, Leo. Yeah, going from fishing to fishing, uh, if you like that. <laughs> Very, clever. Very uh, clever. Yeah, this is in The Guardian <laughs> this morning, and it's the story of James Kane and Barbie Agostini. Uh, they found a safe with $100,000 <laughs> in cash while magnet fishing in a lake in New York. Uh, they explained that they began magnet fishing at the start of COVID-19 due to the allure of treasure hunting, but they didn't want to spend much money on high quality equipment. So magnet fishing is what it sounds really. It simply involves putting a rope with a strong magnet on it into water with the hope of retrieving metal objects. They say they found loads of metal objects, lost keys, coins, but it turned good for them at the weekend when they chucked that magnet in, they dragged up a safe, managed to get it open, stuffed with $100 bills. The good news for the couple gets even better. Mm. They get to keep that money. They wow. did the right thing. They contacted the police. The police said, look, it's not associated with any crime. We've got no way of finding out who the original owners are. So finders, keeper, the keepers, they could barely believe their luck. But it got me thinking, maybe... I'll get my magnet out, <laughs> hook it into the Sen, yes. and maybe... And I, find I, a bicycle. <laughs> I'd be a little bit worried about what I'd find, to be honest. Yes. I don't think it'd be 100,000 euros, 100,000 no. dollars. What but, on um, earth was that safe doing in there with that? Who knows? There? The mystery will never know, maybe. Yeah, but, but this couple... They're going to have a, a pretty good few months, few years, in fact. They are. Kind of ironing all those notes <laughs> very carefully to make sure it's not too too hot. <laughs> Leo McGrew with the papers for us here on France 24.